Hey guys, Dave here in Kansas City. I'm going to talk about Thursday. Uh, first thing I did was I went to a, an interest workshop uh, entitled Developing Community in the Choral Rehearsal. And this was given by the director of the Baylor University Men's Choir, who I heard sing on Wednesday. Um, so he uh, talked about uh, vulnerability, trust, nurturing, honesty, storytelling, um, collaboration, playing, building tradition within the group and fostering group um, commitment. Uh, so some of the things that he does, you know, he works with college boys. So um, he runs the thing sort of like a frat house, and, uh, which is sort of interesting, but I, I think some of the things that he does can be used for other choirs too, uh, obviously. Um, he wouldn't be giving the discussion just for that particular niche. So uh, what, he demonstrated with the choir that who was there behind him uh, some of the things that he did. And actually he gave ownership of some of the uh, uh, talk to the uh, guys in the choir. Each one had a specific duty that, you know, they were going to talk about this or that or the other thing. And, they, and he would hand them the microphone and they would come down and uh, and do their part and then go back and... And then someone else would come down, and so actually three fourths of the uh, presentation was done by the choir itself, which I th thought was kind of cool, and was part of his technique for building community. Is that he delegates things; he doesn't act as you know the supreme ruler of the choir. He uh, is the director, but uh, in directing, he gives away the power to the the people who are in the choir. So I think that was key, and that's something actually I've learned to do uh, over the years. I, you know, when I first started out, I was the dictator, right? <laughs> and, uh, but the problem with that is that when something goes wrong, then you're the only one you can blame, and uh, usually it, it is my fault uh, when something goes wrong, so I have to really look at that. But um, getting back to this workshop, um, so he if he starts the rehearsal. He get, he has everybody write on like a a little post-it note, three things about themselves, and then they pass it on to uh, the guy next to them, or you know uh, another member in the choir, and then um, he just uh, points randomly to someone in the choir, and they read what's on the note about another person, you know, and then everybody claps affirmingly and. Uh, and uh, so, you know, that builds an intimacy because you begin to share some of yourself with other people and other people uh, discover things about you. Uh, so uh, there's a bonding that happens with doing that and there's a trust that's engendered because you, you, you have to trust the other people if you're going to write three things about yourself on the card, right? Um, so that's kind of a good exercise. I don't know that I would do it in our situation, um, but I, I, uh, every rehearsal it probably wouldn't work, but at certain points it might. Um, and uh, so then he has a, you know, he's a large group, it's 100 people, so they have officers and all that sort of thing, and the, he, the officers take care of everything. In fact, he said, even to the point where he didn't plan the tour, you know, the buses to get up to Kansas City from Texas, uh, the officers did that, and they planned the accommodations and where they were going to have food and uh, the whole thing. You know, he just handed it over to the students, um, which gives them ownership, you know, and also teaches them skills about how to uh, organize an event like this and uh, how to be responsible. So, uh, you know, he's a good teacher in that sense. Uh, you know, that end of things maybe is, isn't is necessarily has the same focus for a, a church choir, but uh, I do tend to kind of try to do everything myself and I need to delegate things to other people. Um, you know, when we have an event or uh, like the choral library needs to get organized, you know, I could ask for help with that and I haven't done it, but uh, so, you know, these are just little things that, uh, that came to mind as I was uh, in this workshop. Um, uh, so obviously, uh, being in a choir is a collaborative process, uh, musically, but, uh, in these other ways it can be also collaborative. Um, 
building traditions. So uh, they have jokes and nicknames and that sort of thing that uh, some of the jokes go back to previous choirs and none of the people who told the joke originally are in the choir anymore, but the choir, but it continues on. So, uh, you know, I don't know uh, what kind of a tradition we might build that way. Um, I have a feel, feeling that, and from my experience at Columbia, that these sort of things begin to happen without you making them happen. Uh, and that's probably the best way for them to happen. So I'm just going to let that go. And I think as we begin to build a community with a St. Francis choir, um, that some of that will come about. Also, he says that they do recreation together outside of the choir rehearsal. So he gave an example. So he called up one of the students and they said, said that, oh yeah, so-and-so uh, go play basketball, you know, every Tuesday after the rehearsal and, and people come to my house and watch Japanese cartoons on Saturday morning. And, you know, so they, they all have these other interests, but, uh, but they share them with the guys in the choir. So um, the choir becomes a little community and, and fairly close knit. Um, that hasn't happened yet entirely at St. Francis, uh, but um, it's what I'm working for towards doing. So these choir brunches are sort of the beginning of that. And then um, I'm hoping to have like a day long, you know, with the, with the workshop that began to happen a little bit, we have more time. And uh, so, you know, my thoughts are going there with, with that kind of thing. So the next, uh, oh, and by the way, they sang at the very end of the um, workshop. Uh, as people were leaving, they just broke into a, a, a gospel song and I made a little video of some of it, which uh, I'll send the link so you can hear them uh the other the next workshop i went to was uh toward lifelong singing working with older adult voices so this is talking about people who are aging uh you know and obviously at st francis we have a few of those myself included and um you know so she the the the, the person who gave the uh the talk was uh crystal morin and she's the uh She's from New Hampshire. She has a church choir in New Hampshire, and she's also the uh, state president of the ACDA in New Hampshire. So she has done a lot of research on this and um, you know, knows all these technical medical terms that I, I don't know. Uh, you know, when she says them, I, I can figure out what they mean, but you know, I can't rattle them off at the top of my head. But, um, but basically she she kind of did the bad news and then the good news. So the bad news was, you know, how your body, specifically how your body deteriorates and how that affects the voice. Uh, so things like breathing and uh, hearing and the vocal folds that make the vocal sound, uh, you know, and the muscle deterioration. Um, and then uh, what to do about it, you know, so... It turns out that just like any other muscle, exercise can counteract that. Uh, so she, she had some interesting uh, exercises that uh, I could bring out, and I think I'm going to try some of these. And um, she also uh, cautioned the uh, conductors to uh, be aware of uh, the what's happening in the bodies of some of these older singers and uh, to accommodate that, you know, so you can't just sort of look down at the piano and say, you know, go to measure 46, you know, because if someone's not hearing as well as they used to, they can't see your face or your lips. You're playing the piano so that sound is overriding what you're saying and they don't hear what you say, you know, so she says, wait for silence um, and then look at people and say what you want to say um it was just good little things like that you know there were a whole list of them but uh, that's one example um and uh you know in the church choir in choral groups uh there's a point where they get asked you, you get asked to leave because your voice no longer can keep up with what the expectation of the group is but in a church choir that doesn't happen you know so um sometimes 
former sopranos will have to learn how to sing alto, she said, and you know, that's probably true. Uh, we don't have any of those uh, right at the moment, but um, you know, and then the male voices get higher, so the guys who are basses can't really hit the low notes anymore, uh, and they have a limited range, uh, and uh, but they can do more baritone stuff, so um, also the breath control is less than it used to be, so setting expectations that like you would if you were in front of a college choir uh, you can't do with older singers because they just don't have the lung capacity and that is something that also can be um, improved upon with exercise uh, regular exercise but not um, but it's it's never going to be like you were 20 you know? <laughs> just like pretty much everything else in your body so <laughs> uh, but you, you know all in all that was sort of very instructive and helpful workshop uh, and then uh, as in previous days I ate some lunch and went over to the Kaufman Theater to hear some choral groups um, and uh, there really wasn't anything uh, that I want to detail uh, the way that I did the other day um, there was one choral group who I really liked the 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 Mu Chamber Choir they were from Taiwan um, Meng Xian Peng was their conductor, and uh, it's an all male group, and they wore white suits, <laughs> and uh, they had moves, you know, like a like a uh, like a boy band basically. But there, there were like twenty of them, and uh, <laughs> um, but they had these, you know, it's just a very Asian thing to do to have synchronized synchronized movement, <laughs> and. Uh, uh, so I just found that an interesting culture mix because they didn't do Asian music for the most part. They did one piece that was Asian. And they ended with, um, didn't my Lord deliver Daniel, the spiritual? And I just was, uh, it, it was odd because it was a this mix of cultures, you know, sort of clashing, but yet, uh, the performance worked, you know. So, so he had you had this this sort of boy band formation, you know, doing these very set moves with the music, uh, and so then the music was very formalized too. But the nature of uh, of a spiritual is sort of quasi extemporaneous, you know. Uh, if you hear an American choir sing it, they they do they they are not exacting, you know. The whole point of it is to just be sort of off the cuff um, to an extent, or to sound like you are at least. Um, well, they didn't they didn't have that aspect of it. Um, it was still a cool performance, and they got a standing ovation. Uh, it, it it transmitted uh, energy and and. Uh, but in a very sort of different way than you would expect uh, being an American. And uh, I just, uh, I was uh, just fascinated with the, the cultural overlap of that. Uh, and then uh, I skipped uh, because uh, my friend Karen, who came to the conference with me, who is a native Missourian, um, wanted to take me to the uh, Kansas City Art Museum and to show me some things about Kansas City. So uh, I went with her to do that. And um, and she ran me all around town and wore me out. And I, I uh, since I wasn't all that interested in the evening concerts repertory, which is the Block Sacred Service, which is a big orchestra and chorus piece, um, I just stayed in my room and <laughs> recuperated. So that was Thursday. Uh, got some good stuff out of those workshops, I have to say.